Welcome to seminars with Ada Kappa New. Our speaker this evening is Jeff York. He graduated from NC State in 1985. Since 1993, uh, Jeff has been working with Cadence. Uh, he'll, tonight, he'll be sharing his experiences at NC State, and he'll also be talking about ASIC design and advanced, and advanced node CMOS. Let's welcome the speaker. Thank you. How's everybody doing? Nineteen eighty five, that sounds like a long time ago, doesn't it? Uh, just to give you a little overview, I'm gonna just talk a, a little bit. Uh when I when I told uh Yee that I was a NC State graduate and uh former Ada Kappa New chapter president here, he thought it would be interesting if I maybe gave you a little history from back in those days. So I'll spend a little time on that. And I wanted to kind of give you a progression of uh what I've seen in the IC industry from the time I graduated state to present day. Uh, it may not be quite as technical as some of the seminars you've had. I'm not sure what, uh, what you've had in the past, but I will leave plenty of time at the end for questions and answers. If you want to ask me some, uh, some hard questions, I'll try to answer them as best I can. But I wanted to start off with some, with some very important statistics about uh, NC State. <laughs> show you how times have changed. So these were the, f the four years that I attended NC State. Um, wasn't very pretty. Uh, 1981 through 85, we, uh, we didn't do too well. But the last four years have been much better, and hopefully you were all paying attention this Saturday uh, to this, this particular one to kind of finish off. So those of you that are seniors uh, will definitely be able to leave with a lot better feeling about this than I did. But I think uh, for most of us alumni, this is one of the most important statistics about the university. Talking a little bit about the electrical and computer engineering department. Uh, I don't know how many of you recognize the building in this picture. That's uh, Daniels Hall. Of course, that's where we lived back in the 1980s. Uh, th this campus wasn't here. So all of EE was in Daniels back in those days. Um, including in the basement of Daniels was an actual IC foundry lab. I don't know if that, I doubt it's still there, but uh, we actually could process wafers in the, in the basement of Daniels. There was a, a lab in there that ran, I think it was a four micron NMOS process that we were running in those days. Also during the time I was here, the, the electrical engineering department became the electrical and computer engineering department. I think that happened around 1982. Uh, so when I first came in, we, we were just calling it EE, and then it became ECE. And the first uh, computer engineering degrees were offered at state. Uh, I think probably maybe class of 84 was probably the first year that anybody could get a, a computer engineering degree. I don't know how many, how many here today are computer engineering versus electrical engineering? How, computer engineering and electrical? So it's still, still more electrical than computer, I guess. But I don't know what the difference is today, but back in those days it was whether you had to take power or not. So <laughs> that, was, uh, that was the main thing. Ada Kappa Nu, back in those days, I was just talking to your, your president, and he was telling me that the size of the chapter is about 150 now, so it's grown quite a bit from the days that I was uh, in, in Ada Kappa Nu. I think we had between 40 and 60 members back, back in those days. And f I think the initiation rituals possibly have changed from that time, too. Um, one of the things that we did back then was called bridge making, and I, I, you all know what the bridge is of Ada Kappa Nu if you're, if you're members of that organization. It's the, the emblem that you see here. But back in, uh, back in those days, one of the traditions of the chapter was every new member had to make a bridge out of wood. And you would have to, to carve this, this insignia in wood, and then in the center where the Greek letters are, you had to install a light that would work with, on a switch that you carry in your pocket. So if you can imagine, we would walk around wearing these things, you know, on a, on a, uh, a chain or a string around our neck, and you had this thing in your pocket, a switch, that you could flip the switch and make the middle of it light up. And the week before initiation, we called it Pledge Week, uh, all, the, all the new inductees had to wear a uh, necktie to class for the whole week, wear this thing around your neck, and then any time that an upperclassman that was a uh, Ada Kappa Nu member would pass you, they would test you and you had to turn your light on. If your light didn't work, you know, you got a demerit or something like that. So um, I was thinking, I was telling my wife about that and she said, yeah, you, now I know where all this, uh, these geek stories about 
engineers came from, that we were doing those kind of things back then. Um, but I take it you don't do that anymore, is that right? <laughs> That's too bad, you're really missing out on that one. Uh, but we, ha we would have the pledge week and then we'd have an induction dinner. That was always held either, we usually have it at the barbecue lodge or at, uh, over at uh, Cameron Village, there was some cafeteria, I don't remember the name of it, but that's where we would go for induction night. Because typically the classes were maybe about 20 people and we would have, uh, have a dinner when we did the inductions. And I know there was a whole ritual involved with that as well that we would read from a script that had uh, like these characters called Brother Ampere and Brother uh, Volt and all these kind of things. So, uh, as far as the as the activities that the chapter did back in those days, most things we did were in cooperation with IEEE chapter, and we, we shared an office over in Daniels, and we did uh, most of our things together. The big event we did every year was a was a spring cookout, and back in those days, I know this is another thing that's changed uh, hugely since those days. Um, the, the legal drinking age was 18 back in those days, for at least for beer. So we, we were actually allowed to have a spring cookout over in front of uh, the student center on the big lawn area there and have a keg of beer and uh, grill hot dogs and hamburgers and it was actually a, a university sponsored function. Uh, I doubt that would happen these days, but uh, that was kind of the big thing that, that IEEE Ada Kappa Nu did every, every year back then. Another thing that happened while I was um, uh, president of HKN was this bridge that you see in the picture. And um, we found that thing in a closet. It was up on the third floor of Daniels in one of the big lecture halls. There was kind of a closet on the back. And one day we were looking back, I don't know what we were looking for, but we came across this thing and it was just laying on the floor back there. And we started asking around, where did this come from? And you know, how, how long has it been here? Nobody really knew. But we kind of made it our, our senior project to get this thing installed. And so it was installed outside of Daniels, and that's what this picture is of it when outside of Daniels in a little uh, garden area that, where it sat for a long time. And I was out there probably about a year ago, and I saw that it was gone. And well, I saw it today. So, so I was going to ask you today what happened to it, because uh, I, I, I actually took my daughter over there to see it and it was not there anymore and I was like what happened to the bridge but uh, as I was walking in today I saw it right outside EB2 so it's good to know that it has a new home and that it's still uh, still here representing the Ada Kappa Nu but that's um, yeah that was first put up in 85 back over in Daniels so now I'm gonna switch over and kinda talk about uh, the, the changes I've seen in IC design over the years and kind of and then up to today and give you a little, little more in-depth about some of the things we're doing now. When I graduated from State in 85, I went to work at GE Microelectronics Center over in, in Research Triangle Park. And they had just opened this, I think, in uh, 1982 and built the first uh, IC fabrication facility in North Carolina. And uh, it was interesting, the name of the street that they built it on, they named One Micron Drive. And Back in, uh, in those days, the, the goal was everyone wanted to get to one micron uh, technology. And we were, uh, first technologies I worked on there were four <coughs> micron CMOS, and CMOS was a very new technology in those days. Um, if you think the Intel processors that were being built in the mid 80s were all still NMOS technology processors, and CMOS was starting to take off around the mid 80s. We had a four micron CMOS line there. We were building uh, gate array devices that had 1,500 gates maximum uh, logic size that you could build had one layer of metal. Uh, about a year later we had moved to two micron CMOS that we could get up to about 10,000 gates and had two layers of metal. And, and this was the, the basic flow diagram of how we designed chips in those days. Uh, there's not a whole lot of blocks there and it was kind of very primitive in, in if maybe probably what you're learning today. We did this thing called schematic capture and, and you, I'm sure you know what schematics are but in those days, there were engineering workstations, and when you designed even a digital logic chip, you would just draw gates in schematics and wire them up. So you would basically have to do it all on paper first, and then you would just draw the schematic, and this is the function that I want to implement. So you do the schematic capture, then you would do logic simulation. That hasn't really changed that much. You would just come up with some stimulus to put in and see if you get the right answer out. Then we did manual placement, so that we had um, Basically, it started out on paper even, and then there were some tools for it. But you had a big grid, 
and you would just like write on the grid where I'm going to place every one of these gates that I've drawn on my schematic, and then you would go in and uh, a terminal and type it all in. And that's how we would place the gates. We did have an automatic router, so we ran a tool that would route, route the uh, wires up. And then we would do, finally, logic simulation with delays after we had the thing routed to see if it was really going to work. And that was pretty much the design flow for doing a chip. Um, as you can imagine, you know, we're only doing 1,500 gates. It's not that bad. You can, you can probably get this done in maybe a month, something like that. Um, so from a productivity standpoint and what was available in those days, it wasn't so bad. Another interesting thing about uh, GE Microelectronics Center is it was an inc incubator of a lot of companies back in those days. Uh, you've probably all heard of Synopsys uh, Company, which is kind of the main competitor of Cadence, but it actually was incubated out of the GE Microelectronics Center. There was uh, the, this current CEO, Art DeGius of uh, Synopsys, worked there. And they started a little group called Optimal Solutions, and they were kind of starting out this thing called logic synthesis, which nobody had ever heard of. And it was the idea that you could actually just write a description of the, the Boolean function you wanted to implement, and then a, a program would implement that in Gates for you. And that was a really new technique back then. Uh, they ended up creating a you know, billion-plus-dollar company out of that. Uh, another little company started up called ISS, which was doing... Um, physical verification software, like design rule checking and that sort of software. Uh, they, they ended up merging with a company called ArcSys and created a co another company called Avanti. I don't know, if probably never, none of you have heard of it either, but Synopsys eventually bought up Avanti and that's now part of Synopsys as well. And, and a lot of the early Cadence employees also came from GE Microelectronics Center. So, so I stayed there uh, for about two years. Um, Around the end of 86, I, I kind of experienced my first uh, layoff in the industry. GE laid off some people, and, and I kind of got disillusioned because I, uh, a lot of people I'd worked with were gone, and, and it's like, well, this is no fun. You know, the company uh, doesn't like the employees, and, and it was kind of a, you know, as a young engineer, it was, it was kind of a, a bad thing to go through. So I thought, you know, I don't really want to be here anymore. I think I'll go somewhere else. So. Uh, you know, I, I looked around, I found another job, and I went to work at uh, Alcatel Network Systems uh, over in Raleigh and started doing ASIC design for, for it was a Sonnet. Uh, Sonnet had just come out as, a, as an optical networking standard then, and I designed uh, uh, a network processor for, for one of the first Sonnet uh, gear that we were doing there. Again, it was two micron design, about 10,000 gates, used that same manual design process. Uh, but, but as I was there, I learned what I call life lesson number one, which is money does not equal happiness. Because uh, kind of the, the thing was, you know, they, they drew me there with more money. I got there, and, and I was only there about a year, and I realized that, you know, I didn't like this job. It, it was not a good job. It was just the environment was not good. Uh, the, the technical work was fine, but, but there's a lot more to, I guess, an engineering job than just the work that you do. It's a lot of it's the people that you work with. And, and kind of the environment that you're working in. So, so I learned that lesson and talked to some of my friends and, and did what I called the escape from Alcatraz. Uh, that was, it, it had gotten to the point that most of us that working there called it uh, the Traz. It was, it was Alcatel, but we called it uh, the Traz. And uh, so I escaped from Alcatraz and actually went back to GE, uh, which I called Jimmy G Semiconductor Take Two. And, and because they were, they were doing some exciting new technologies there. Uh, they were doing this now 1.25 micron CMOS, uh, which was, uh, I think we called uh, advanced, <laughs> advanced cell or something like that. Still only two layers of metal. And we were also doing something called silicon on sapphire, which I don't know if you've heard of, but it's um, actually the wafers themselves were sapphire uh, substrate, and then you deposit silicon on that to build, to build the chip. So it was similar to, to maybe uh, SOI technology of today, uh, but uh, the wafers were actually translucent because the, the sapphire you could see through. It was kind of a pink, pinkish color. It was, they were pretty cool to look at. And we could now get up to about 30,000 30, gates on a chip. But then it came along um, 1989, so shortly after I'd gone back, uh, Neutron Jack Welch, I don't know if, how many of you have heard of him, but if you do any kind of like business studies, uh, Jack Welch was the CEO of GE for a long time, 
and his nickname was Neutron Jack back in the 80s because the, 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 the story was that usually when Neutron Jack came in, the buildings were left standing, but everything else was gone. So it was kind of like the neutron bomb of, of the day. Um, he came out with an edict around that time. and He said, in GE, if you're not number one or number two in your industry, no matter what you do, we're going to either fix you, sell you, or close you. Those were the options. Well, of course, we were not number one or number two. We were a pretty small little microelectronics uh, group. Um, at the time, there was a company called LSI Logic that was probably the biggest uh, company in, the, in what we were doing. So, you know, we definitely were on that fixed sell or close list. Luckily, we were a sell. We weren't a close. Uh, I guess he didn't see any way to fix us. But, um, so we were sold to Harris Semiconductor, which was based out of Melbourne, Florida. And, um, but but th they decided they didn't like North Carolina that much. So almost immediately they came in and said, come on down, come on down to Melbourne. The weather's great down here. And uh, we really want you to come down. So, uh, you know, I thought about that a little while and, you know, got in the car and three, two, one, lift off. I was uh, on my way to, to Melbourne. And so I moved down to Florida in uh, 1989. We continued at, at Harris there to support the GE technologies, so they actually kept the, the IC foundry up here in, in RTP for a few years. Uh, they eventually sold that to Motorola and then eventually it closed. But, um, but they moved all the design engineers to Florida because that's where their design groups were. And while I was working there at Harris, uh, we actually broke the one micron barrier that we'd been going after for so long. Uh, we started up a, a 0.8 micron CMOS technology there. And for the first time, we had three, layer, three layers of metal that we could do, uh, do interconnect with, which was, uh, allowed us to become much denser in what we could do. We could actually get 100,000 gates of logic on a single chip. So we thought you know, we, thought we had made it. Um, I won't go into a lot of depth about Harris. Um, you know, in, in a lot of ways, there may have been things that were similar environmentally to, to Alcatel. Um, but I say there were great things in Florida. So uh, number one there was meeting my wife. So I met her while I was in Florida. Uh, number two I listed was shuttle launches. So we lived, uh, I lived about 30 miles from Kennedy Space Center. So I could see the shuttle launches from my back, backyard and actually went up and got to see a couple live. So that was, that was pretty neat. And then they had really good hot wings down there uh, in Melbourne. But you notice the one thing that's not on my list of great things in Florida is Harris Semiconductor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, there again, I found that uh, it just wasn't quite right, the right place for me. Uh, it just wasn't a lot of fun to work there. And, and kind of learned, uh, I call it life lesson number two, but it's really sea life lesson number one again, because, uh, you know, they, they enticed me to move to Florida, and, but, you know, the money wasn't really, didn't really make any difference. Um, it did keep me there for that number of years, because that was my first experience with what were called golden handcuffs. And that was where uh, you get paid to stay and you get the money at the end. So you don't have to, you don't get paid immediately. So it was a retention, retention incentive, I think they called it, or something like that. But uh, so I basically had to work there three years to, to see that money. But as soon as that happened, uh, I was ready to, to move on from there. Um, so that was when, when I found my way to Cadence. Uh, it's kind of interesting how, how I ended up in Cadence. There was a friend of mine that, that also went to state, and we had known each other for a long time, and we, uh, we worked together at, at GE out of college. Uh, we actually both had gone to work at Alcatel together. Uh, when I went back to GE, he went on to somewhere else. Um, he ended up working at a company called Valid, which was an, an early uh, EDA company, electronic design automation company. And in, in 1992, Valid was, was bought by Cadence. So he became a Cadence employee. So in, uh, in 93, he was working at Cadence. I was ready to get out of Harris, and, and Cadence happened to have an office in Melbourne where I was living at the time. So I called up my friend and uh, said, hey, I think I'd like to come work at Cadence, work things out. So I ended up uh, going to Cadence. So, so remember, you know, all the people you're going to school with today are probably going to be the source of your future jobs. I mean, that, that, that really does happen. I'm still working today with guys that I graduated at State with at Cadence that, uh, that I've known for, you know, 25, 30 years. And uh, I think there's four currently in my office in Cary that, uh, that all went to state. So, 
you, you will stay with the same people for a long time. I, I know you've probably all heard of Cadence if you're, if you're in electrical engineering. Uh, of course, Cadence was formed uh, by a merger of SDA Systems and ECAD back in 1988. SDA was a company that made uh, basically a place and route uh, software type of platform. And ECAD was a company that created a, a product called Dracula, which was one of the first uh, design rule checking type softwares for, for integrated circuits. And Cadence has grown mostly by acquisitions over the year. I have another thing, maybe if, if anybody's interested later, I can show it to you, but it's called the genealogy chart of Cadence. And it's, it's too big probably to fit on here, but I could scroll it up. But it's, uh, it shows all the companies that Cadence has acquired over the years, and there's probably at least 50 of them. I mean, it's, it's long. Um, and, and that's, you know, it's just it's been a constant uh, change over the years, but it's, but it's been interesting and been good. Uh, the, the part of Cadence that I work in is called the Global Services Group. And I've really been in services. We've had lots of different names over the, the, the 17, 18 years I've been there. But, uh, but I've always been part of services. And what we do there is, is a couple of things. Uh, one is providing expert methodology help for, for customers of Cadence software. So that's going in to companies and showing them you know, how to set up a design flow, how to use Cadence products. Uh, so serving kind of consultants in that way. Uh, another thing is what we call uh, design services or design outsourcing, and that's where we actually are designing chips for uh, outside companies. You know, some of them happen to be Cadence customers of, of software, some aren't. So we basically will design chips for anyone that comes in and, and wants a chip designed uh, you know, on, on Cadence tools. And then lately we've started something called hosted design solutions, and that's where Cadence um, it's kind of a software as a service, if you've heard of that term. But uh, Cadence will host the, the computers, the software, and everything at Cadence. And customers can just connect in through a, a VPN link and, and use Cadence products kind of on a service uh, basis. So a lot of startup companies like to do this. They don't have to go out and buy computers. They don't have to buy software. They can just, uh, you know, just contract to have this, this capability available. It allows them to have a design uh, platform that they can immediately start start uh, turning out chips. Uh, along the way at, at Cadence, um, in 1999, I actually had the opportunity to, to relocate back to North Carolina. Uh, we had an office here in Cary, so I moved back to North Carolina because uh, I really like it here. I mean, I'm originally from North Carolina. Uh, I'd gone to school here, and it, it was a good opportunity to get back. So, uh, so that was a chance I was able to come back and not not have to change jobs. Um, so kind of what I've seen, though, over the years is, you know, that Moore's Law was correct. You know, I talked about those early days we were doing 4-micron CMOS, and, and, and we'd heard, first heard about Moore's Law probably back in the, you know, in the 80s, saying that the, the uh, designs were going to double in complexity every 18 months, and, and, you know, you thought for a while it looked like, well, maybe we're never going to get past 1 micron, or we're never going to get past some next barrier. But I was just thinking about it today, and the time that I've been at Cadence, you know, these were kind of all the different uh, nodes that, that we've gone through. And I joined there, we were doing 0.8 micron, and then we've done significant work in every one of these technologies down to, you know, today we're working on uh, some 22 nanometer designs. Although the bulk of today's work is like 40 nanometer designs. Um, and we're approaching 100 million gates on a chip. I mean, there's been chips done with, with probably more than that. But if you look at the kind of things we're doing, which are like system on a chip, ASIC type designs, um, I think a 90 million gates with a uh, ton of memory is about the biggest we've done so far. But we're, if you just look at the orders of magnitude leap that have happened over the years, it's pretty incredible. I thought I'd give you a couple examples of some, of maybe some neat things we've worked on. Um, this was a, a chip we did in, uh, in 90 nanometer technology. Uh, it's probably the highest volume uh, device that we've worked on. I think we did this, I'm trying to remember what year it was, probably like 2003 maybe, something like that. But it was, um, it was the graphics interface that went into the Xbox uh, 360. Um, and so I guess there's been like 31 million of these things made so far. So, I mean, by far, it's the, it's the highest volume part that we've worked on. Uh, but it was, it, it was a very interesting 
chip that we worked on. Um, I don't know how much you know about how like Xbox and these things are put together. Um, generally, the end, the, the, the people that sell it aren't really involved that much in, in designing it or building it. Uh, they're marketing companies. So the, you know, this particular <coughs> um, device, IBM had a lot to do with it. So if you know the, the processor in an Xbox is an, is an IBM uh, processor. The graphics card was an ATI uh, graphics uh, chip that was a, a custom graphics chip that we designed. And then like Cadence designed the interface, which basically one sat on the processor chip, one sat on the graphics chip, and it was kind of a, a proprietary uh, backplane interface that operated at, at two gigahertz. So um, it's just interesting how these things get pulled together. So some of the we had to do things on this uh, design, like uh, like creating uh, coax shielding. You see here on on uh, on chip. If you think about that, what we were doing, we were routing these high speed clocks. So we put we had to put layers of metal uh, around. It was we've done a lot of two D shielding, but in this one we actually did three D shielding. So we were shielding the clocks both uh, horizontally and vertically using the metal layers on the chip in order to uh, cut down on noise. And there's really no tools to do that today. So you have to, th that pretty much has to be done in some custom fashion. So we came up with a methodology for, for implementing that. One of, the, one of the biggest things that we deal with today is, is power on, uh, on ASICs. And I've seen that become more and more of an issue. Uh, this just kind of gives a breakdown on a typical ASIC or system on chip, like where the power is used. And you see the biggest part of it's used in the clock network, uh, either the clock tree or in the actual the clock portion of the flip-flop switching on our design. And, and there's various parts in the other part. but um, So a big focus is always how can I reduce power on chips? And, and you can imagine why, you know, going into cell phones and iPods and all other kind of, uh, of equipment. So, so here's an example. If you remember that little five box flow diagram I showed earlier of how, you know, how we designed chips back in 85. This is kind of a front end design flow today for, for like a low power chip. Uh, it's kind of an eye chart. Uh, I'm not going to go into it in a lot of detail. But if you look at some of the key points, you know, today we're doing things like, you know, like uh, system C, C++ as an entry language for, for chip design versus drawing out schematics. So you know, today you can write algorithms in C, and we have uh, Cadence has a product called C to Silicon, which can take uh, C code and turn it into RTL code, the register transfer language code. And then you can then obviously go from there through um, normal design synthesis like you would do down here. So you, know, you can get from C to RTL code. Uh, you know, most of the RTL code for a lot of system on chip designs is going to be IP, uh, inter you know, intellectual property that you would go and purchase, say like an ARM processor or something of that nature. Uh, power is looked at all through this phase now. So within the industry, there's, there are several different formats. Cadence supports one called the CPF, which is a common power format. And what it allows you to do is, is capture your power intent uh, together with your design. So up front, you say, okay, I'm, I'm going to design, you know, this multi-core, um, say, cell phone platform that's, that's going to uh, be able to do, you know, a cell phone, a MP3 player, whatever things you have on it. And, and you design up front and say, okay, I want this one to power down in certain times. I want this one to, you know, only be powered on. I want to have this little always-on block over here that controls when things power up. And, and all that stuff can be captured in the intent up front. And then the design tools that are available today from Cadence and, and other uh, providers can take all of those input files and basically you know, pull them together and get you down to a point that you've got a design that can go into you know, synthesis and physical implementation. So if you imagine how, you know, how complex this flow has become nowadays um, compared to what it was, but you know, you're talking about you know, tens of millions of gates that are going into a device, single device now, versus thousands in the past. So you have to have a lot more um, uh, capability in order to do that. 
we've also been looking at, at a lot of advanced uh, low power techniques. Um, there, there's a number of techniques that have been used for, for quite some time. Um, clock gating is one, if you're familiar with that. That's just a case where you, you gate off your clock so that it's not switching when you're not actually needing it. That, that can, as you see, that can save a lot of power because that's where most of your power is going on a chip. Uh, but what's happened is the technologies have gotten smaller. When we really went beyond about 90 nanometer technologies, the leakage power just grew exponentially in, in CMOS technology. So what happened is um, it got to a point where maybe you know, half the power on a chip would be leakage current just from the devices not switching at all. And it's just uh, the nature of, of the technology getting smaller. So techniques have, have to be ad, uh, adopted to try to cut down on, on leakage power as well as on dynamic power. So some of the techniques that, that we've been investigating the past few years, dual flops is a technique where you, where you combine flip-flop bits into a single cell. Uh, most of what we're doing is standard cell design. If you're familiar with standard cell implementation. So th traditionally you always just had a flip-flop was just one bit with a clock and, and uh, you, you would put down however many you know, million of those you have on your chip. What we've tried to do now is combine those into multi-bit type cells. And what you can save is, is in the clock network within the cell. So those old traditional flip-flop cells would have like two inverters in them as a part of the clock buffering just for that one cell. Now you can combine, say, two bits or four bits in a single cell and still have two inverters uh, that serve as the clock buffer. So overall, you can reduce your, your clock network power by 30 to 40 percent just by cutting down the number of switching buffers you have uh, in your clock tree there. Low swing clocks is just a matter of reducing voltage on your clocks. Uh, back biasing is something to deal with leakage. Uh, the main reason you get leakage is because you can never turn these transistors off completely in these small technologies. So what we do is a, a process compensated back bias. That's where you would put a process monitor on chip, and this would just be a, a little kind of mixed signal device that can monitor leakage current and decide, okay, is this a, a hot lot that leaks a lot, or is this a, maybe a slower lot that doesn't leak as much? And based on, on looking at that, the process monitor can then output a, a compensation voltage that's used to bias the, uh, the substrate uh, to turn off or, or to, you know, to drive uh, the devices more into uh, turnoff mode when, when they're not being used. Um, PSO is power shutoff, so um, nowadays it's very typical to have switches on chip that will turn off power to you know, large sections of logic at any given time. Uh, to start with, that was basically done off chip and you would have maybe like you know, power islands, say three or four power islands on a chip. We've now gotten a technology you can, we call fine grain power shutoff where you can basically have the switches on chip and you can cut off smaller sections of logic and it, so it can happen dynamically. You can turn off parts of the chip as you need, as you need to. A um, couple of the other techniques listed here, um, you know, double edge flops is, is clocking basically on both edges so you can uh, reduce power that way. So I showed the front end flow. This is more of the back end flow for low power uh, implementation. This is more of a block level, but really the top level is similar. Um, so you start from a point of, you know, most of these flows start from RTL code of a design. So you have register transfer language description of a, of a chip that you want to build. And you take that uh, through logic synthesis. This is a power driven one, so, so you would bring in one of those uh, common power format files together with it. You have to bring in uh, timing constraints together with your, your RTL code. And all these things are, are the inputs to a design flow. So they would drive the synthesis process, which will give you basically a gate level representation of a design. And then we take it through uh, you know, clock tree synthesis, placement and routing, and all these are pretty much automated processes nowadays. Um, Cadence has a, a product called uh, SOC Encounter, or uh, latest version we call Encounter Digital Implementation System, EDI. Uh, I don't, you, you guys probably use some of those tools here, I'm not sure, but um, basically that's the tools that we use to implement these designs from, from Netlist all the way to uh, a, a tape out uh, database. 
So this flow, this uh, flow has gotten a little more complex than what it was, you know, back in the 80s as well, when we were hand placing and and uh, routing. I want to show a couple more uh, design examples. This was a, a 32 nanometer test chip that we just did uh, last summer. Um, well, summer of 2009, and it was really it was the first uh, kind of 32 nanometer chip that was, was that went through this particular foundry, uh, you know, as a real design. Uh, it was a kind of a multi-architecture JPEG. This was one that was driven uh, using that C to silicon product that I talked about. So there was a JTAG, uh, I mean a, a JPEG. Uh, processor that was written in C code that was targeted uh, into this technology using C to silicon and I think there's like four I believe there's four JPEG engines on the chip uh, an ARM M0 uh, pros processor core analog digital converter that runs at 80 megabits per second we also put some of the low power features in uh, dual edge flop experiment and uh, it was a design that you know that we taped out in the 32 nanometer and we've got you know parts in the lab now that are working. This is a you know a fairly small chip, um, but it was done as a, as a test chip back in uh, 2009. And compared to that one, the the biggest actual um, I guess customer design and production type design that we've done was a was this 156 channel fiber optic switch that we also completed back in uh, 2009. This was a 65 nanometer design. So if you look at the size of this chip, 20 millimeters by 20 millimeters. I don't know, you know how much you know about that, but that's pretty big. I mean, that's uh, especially in 65 nanometers. Uh, about the biggest chip that you can build is, is around 25 millimeters, because that's the size of what they call reticle. So that's the biggest image that they can actually pattern on a wafer. So this one was, you know, kind of approaching the physical limits of what can be built. Um, the interesting thing about this design, you see, if you look at this floor plan, this thing, this whole section in the middle, was a mixed signal block, and these were optical, uh, basically optical serial interfaces uh, for the whole 156 channel. And the way this thing was designed, this chip was not even going to go into any sort of package. They, they had a, a mechanical interface. They were going to bring a bundle of fiber optic cables directly into the top of the chip, 156 uh, fiber optic cables that would mount right on top, and, and it was actually a, a, a multi-chip type module too. So you, you imagine this chip with these electrical uh, serial interfaces, another smaller chip that mounts right on top of this that are the optical interfaces, and then these fiber optic bundle coming right into the top of it. Um, so there were there were a lot of uh, this was you know quite challenging mechanically as well as uh, just from a IC design standpoint. Um, they have this chip uh, in in a lab. The, the guys that built it are actually are, are in an outside the U.S., but they're currently testing it and it's working quite well. Um, an interesting thing about this one is it didn't have low power requirements. It actually had uh, constant power requirements because of the mechanical issues they had. They wanted this chip to kind of maintain a constant temperature, so they wanted it to basically run all the time. They didn't want it to cool off or heat up because if it did, you get any kind of misalignment in these um, in these optics and the thing wouldn't work. So it actually had to be designed. There, there's there's logic in this chip to actually make parts of it run when when they're idle. So so it runs and just burns power. It burns quite. A, I can't remember the total power number on this, but it was maybe like 50 watts. It's a it's a pretty uh, power hungry device. But it was it was the biggest design. Uh, it says here 45 million gates, 81 uh, megabits of SRAM on chip. Had a total of like three and a half billion transistors total. Uh, counting all the mixed signal and everything on it. So to date, that's the biggest thing that, that, that I've worked on. But far, a long way from the 1500 uh, gate thing that I did back in 85. So that's the, that's the last slide I have. Um, okay, so thanks everyone for coming and let's
Gentile speaker. This is Venetia. Yeah, thank you all for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Please come here and talk to